Welcome to Chromaticus. Today we're going to break down the first 64 bars of Jupiter from the Planets by Gustav Holst. As always, we are in score in C here, and this just means that you don't have to transpose in your head for the transposing instruments, such as horns and clarinets and B-flat and whatnot. Everything reads in concert pitch, so if you see a C, it is a C. The tempo marking allegro here is lively and fast tempo, and giocoso means humorous. So the bringer of jollity here, Jupiter, is the bringer of festivities, celebration, cheerfulness. So humorous in this context could probably mean to play in a lively and fun manner as if a celebration is going on. Here we have staccato markings in the strings, and then it says sempre staccato, and you don't see any more staccato markings. Uh, sempre staccato just means always staccato because this was written back when there was no computers, right? You did everything by hand. So you would have to write out like hundreds of these tiny little dots for a full score. So by just writing a few of them and then writing sempre staccato, meaning always staccato, you wouldn't have to hand write every tiny little dot. It would just kind of be implied until you tell the players that it ends. In the very beginning, we just have one texture. We have this layered ostinato. A layered ostinato is essentially a harmonic bed from which you can build on top of. In this case, it's an up high ostinato with a melody down below, but it could be in the mid range or it could be down below with melody above. It's really up to the composer and what kind of feel and vibe they're going for. In this case, it's the C Ionian mode. If you were to write it out as a chord, it will be a C6-9 chord. And in measure 12, it's confirmed with that big fat C major chord in the orchestra. So this Divisi marking in the strings means that only half the string section is playing each line, which naturally brings down the intensity and the amplitude of each line because you're dividing up the string section. So you're dividing up how many players are playing each line. And it's really interesting how Holst staggers this ostinato. He doesn't just start on the downbeat here and bringing the whole line in in both sections. He first starts in violins two and they're playing in unison for the first measure and then they split here and now they're playing the separate lines. And the violins one rest in the first beat and then they come in on beat two also in unison and then notice halfway through the second measure they split, right? So we have this sort of staggered entrance of the four different lines that we end up with. This subtle development over time by staggering the lines rather than bringing them in all on the downbeat is so much more interesting. So don't be afraid to do that in your composition and your orchestration um, and stagger things rather than have them all come in at once. In measure six, this is where the melody first comes in. The ostinato pattern is still in the violins one and the violins two section. So this is a pretty big sound. You could have up to like 14, 16 players in a section. And we have two sections here playing the ostinato. So you want a pretty big sound for the melody for it to project over this. Also keep in mind that the harmonic material, the ostinato here is up high in the treble clef. And if you notice that the melody is actually below the treble clef. So the melody is below the harmony, sort of the opposite of what you would typically expect. So because of that, and because of the large sound of the two violin sections, you want a really, really strong melodic sound, a lot of instruments, a lot of power, so that it projects over the harmony and stands out as the foreground material, as the melody. Holst chose to have six horns in unison. That is a very strong, very powerful sound that would probably project just fine over the string ostinato, um, but just for some extra color and maybe a little more strength, he adds in the violas and the cellos also in unison. The strings and brass don't typically blend that well, the exception being the violas and the cellos, they do blend pretty well with the French horn. 
And you want to think in terms of tone color when you're blending different instruments. Uh, the strings in this case kind of soften the tone of the loud brass. Also notice in the dynamics, along with the forte marking, we also have molto pesante. Molto means very and pesante means heavy. So these are the kinds of directions that will give live players a, a slightly different feel. So in this case, the players will probably be a little more aggressive and dig in a little bit more with markings like these. I do want to take a second and go over this melody because this is just a fantastic melody. And if you struggle to write melody, this is a really great piece to study and just take note of what's going on here. <laughs> The first thing to take notice of is the rhythmic values. So we have eighth notes, we have quarter notes, we have 16th notes here, we have dotted eighth notes, right? So it's not just like straight quarter notes or just quarter notes and like two eighth notes. There's a lot of different rhythmic values going on in this melody. Something that I think is often overlooked by beginner composers is ties over a bar line. This is actually really important when you want to write a very unique melody because without that you end up sticking to the you end up sticking to the meter a lot. And the last thing to notice is the articulations. This is also very important. The first note has a dot on it, right? A staccato marking. So this is actually half of that value. So this is a 16th note with an eighth note rest. Then he has the tenuto marking. So you're playing this for the full value. And we have the tie over the bar line. We have another staccato marking here, another tenuto. Then we have 16th notes and they're all staccato. So they're very kind of short and abrupt notes there. So the articulations kind of change throughout. They go back and forth. It's not just like one legato articulation for the entire melody or just straight staccato markings. If you listen to the melody, it's very, very unique and it's very memorable and, that, and that's why. In measure 12, the statement is a short, punchy tutti chord in the orchestra, with the exception being trumpets one and two. They continue on for four bars into the next section, and they also have a dynamic swell. So you have this very punchy, staccato, very loud tutti chord, and then trumpets one and two slowly swell up from a piano dynamic up to a forte dynamic. Let's break down the tutti chord so you can see how it's balanced in the orchestra. This particular tutti chord is a C major triad in root position. Throughout the orchestra, there are 15 roots, five thirds, and seven fifths. For purposes of clarity in the orchestra, you want it to be balanced that way. You want mostly roots, um, less fifths, and very few thirds. The thirds will actually stand out quite a bit. Um, that's why you don't really need a whole lot of them. If you have too many thirds and not enough roots, it can tend to make the chord sound unbalanced. If you look at the lowest register, this C here, he only has the contra bassoon. Uh, that's a really, really low C. There's not a lot of instruments that can even play that low. Uh, but you also don't want too much emphasis down on a register that low because it gets muddy down there. The next C here, he has one instrument from each section. We have the contra bass from the string section, the tuba from the brass section, and the bassoon number three from the woodwinds. So we have a nice strong bass note down here. The fifth in this register is actually um, pretty close to being in the low interval limit range. It'll still sound clearly, but it's, it's getting close to the area where the fifths will start to sound muddy. So that's why there's not a whole lot of strength on the fifth here. Um, there's much more strength on the roots and you can see right above it again, the next root here is very strong. You have timpani one, bass trombone, bassoon, and bass clarinet. It's pretty uncommon to see the timpani play intervals like this. And it's also playing a fourth down in the bass range, which is pretty dissonant in the bass. And then they're also below the what we call low interval limits. So it's a very kind of muddy and dissonant sounding in that range. But it's a good example of two concepts. One is that the timpani is kind of one of those instruments that kind of sits in between uh, definite pitch and indefinite pitch. And the other is that sometimes you gotta just go with your intuition, your guts and a feeling, um, or go for a sound that you like, but not really thinking about the rules. You can just break them sometimes when you want to. It actually reminded me of a quote from Walter Piston's book. Imperfections may exist even in the works of masters, and these are worth discovering, but it must not be forgotten that the unaccountable stroke of genius is also a reality. The reason you don't see the string section much in this chord is because the rest of the string section is playing the ostinato. So the contra bass is really the only string section that's actually open to be able to play in this chord. And the next fifth is just played by trombone two. Uh, but brass instruments, especially in a louder dynamic, are very strong. So you don't always need a lot of instruments on a certain note in a certain register if you have a brass instrument playing it. If you just had one woodwind playing this, it would be a lot weaker of a sound. And then the next C, you have trumpet four, 
And then the first third, you just have trombone one. Again, there's only one instrument on it, but it is a brass instrument. It's a trombone. We're in a loud dynamic. So that's still going to be a pretty strong E. So even though there's not a lot of thirds, he does give them to more powerful instruments. And that is important to take note of. In the next register, the G here, you have trumpet three, clarinet three, and oboe three. Now the trumpet, especially in a loud dynamic, is very powerful and it's going to blow away a woodwind. So it's a good idea to have at least two, sometimes three woodwinds doubling that trumpet so that they really kind of blend in with that tone rather than just getting completely washed out. But it also depends on what the note is. Notice in this register here, this E, again the third, we have a trumpet which is a very loud, powerful, strong instrument on our third. And we only have one oboe doubling it because you don't want too much strength on that third. Uh, but this is really just more for a little bit of tone color. Whereas the C here, the root, we have the trumpet, and then he also has clarinet two, English horn, and oboe two. So he has three woodwinds doubling that trumpet for a very strong sound, but it's the root. So he wants that to be very strong. And then the next G just has clarinet one, and then the other C and E finishing up the highest octaves are the flutes and the piccolos. Also in the brass section, we have again the tuba on the low C, and then an octave above, we have the bass trombone. So we have C and octaves in the brass. Then we have the triad G, C, and E here again in the brass. And then in the next register, we have the triad again in the trumpets. And then we have the woodwinds complete the triad again above the brass with the other woodwinds and the percussion blending in with the brass chords. So this is essentially a very large brass chord with some nice reinforcement from the woodwinds and from the percussion section. After the big C major chord in measure 12, as he has these trumpets swell up dynamically, he also starts to build up the layered ostinato to a fuller, louder texture with the addition of the woodwinds. Just like in the beginning, he staggers the entrance of the woodwinds like he did with the violins. But there's even just a subtle variation here with the 16th note rest, which you didn't see in the violin section. So he's still staggering it. He, he changes it just a tiny little bit and all these little tiny subtle variations add up to really, really great orchestration. In the oboes and the clarinets where he has three players, he chose to have the top line played by two players and the bottom played by one. If you look at the oboes, one and two, A2 is playing the top line here and three is playing the lower line. Same thing in the clarinets, one and two, A2 is playing the top line and then when the third one comes in, it's playing the lower line. He also adds in the violas and the cellos on the ostinato as well. So now with the addition of two more string sections and almost the entire woodwind section, we have an even much larger sound for the ostinato. It's really important to keep building things like this or, or taking things away and making them smaller rather than just keeping the same exact uh, size or orchestration of the ostinato or of the melody or just general harmony because this is what really makes great orchestration stand out from okay orchestration. Now that Holst has expanded the instrumentation, resulting in a lot more orchestral weight on the ostinato lines and a little bit more orchestral size with the expansion of the piccolos, he now expands the melodic instrumentation uh, to keep up with the bigger sound. He has the contrabassoons and the contrabass playing the melody down an octave. Remember that even in score and C, those two instruments still transpose down an octave. In the next octave above, he has bass clarinet and all three bassoons playing in unison in that octave. He also has the bass and tenor tuba in that octave with the tenor trombones up another octave, two tenor trombones. This is a very low melody with a lot of high up harmonic energy and it's a very, very cool sound. He also has the timpanis play along the melody as well. Timpanis don't often play the melody, but it's a really cool sound when you're in this very kind of high intensity, energetic kind of melody. The timpanis add that nice punctuation. He has two timpani players because he wanted six timpani. Um, so he gives three timpanis to each player. So that way you have six timpanis total. So you can actually double the melody kind of going back and forth between the two timpani players. Notice when he gets here into measure 20, he's playing this 16th note figure. Uh, but because of the specific notes and how the timpanis are tuned, he has to go back and forth between the two players in that very rapid sequence. This is probably really difficult to get to sound smooth. So what he ends up doing is the first 16th note of this little phrase here, he just has him hold it rather than mute it. So this note sustains here while the other timpani plays the two 16th notes in the middle. Rather than putting the rest here, it might sound a little bit too choppy if you did that. Uh, so I think it's probably why he did it this way. 
Towards the end of the melody here, he drops out the timpanis. And this gives a pretty cool effect because the ending of the melody loses that booming bass effect from the timpani, that really percussive sharp edge as well. And by drawing back the percussion, it leaves a little bit of room and allows for the impact of the percussion coming up in measure 22 to have more power and more emphasis because of that little break that he gives the timpanis. So at measure 22, when he brings in this nice big full tutti chord and the full orchestra, and he brings back in the timpani and the rest of the percussion, it has a little bit more of an emphasis to it than if you just kept playing the timpanis the whole time without that little break. In this chord this time, it's an E major chord in first inversion. So the bass note is G sharp. We have the bass and the cellos in octaves, which is very common. The violas are playing the E in octaves. The violins too are playing the B in octaves, but it's not divisied here. It's actually double stops. This gives more power to the chord as opposed to if they were to play divisi, because when you're playing double stops, every player is playing both notes. Whereas if it was divisi, only half players would be playing one note and half the players would be playing the other note. So this gives a lot of strength to the root here and a lot of strength to the fifth of the chord there. And then you have all the violins, one playing just that root again up in the high register. In the percussion section, we have the cymbal crash in the beginning of the chord. We have triangle and timpani, both doing tremolos the entire time the chord is sustaining. Notice the timpani is playing the E, the root, the whole time, which gives a nice rumbly effect on the E note there. And then the triangle gives that nice shimmering, bright effect on the top end. In the brass section, the bass trombones and the tuba are playing along with the cellos, which is pretty expected. The tenor tuba is playing the root along with the timpani in the same register there. Blending timpani and brass is very common as well. They blend nicely, they have a nice sound together. And the tenor trombones are playing the G sharp and then the root E an octave higher. In the four trumpets, you have three of them playing the root. You have E in octaves. And then this trumpet is playing this E as well, doubled here. And then you have one trumpet playing the fifth in the middle. And you see the same thing in the horns, just an octave below. You have the E in octaves here, E in octaves here. So you got four horns playing the E and then two are playing unison on the B in the middle here. So this upper E in the horns is overlapping with this E in the trumpets. When we get to the woodwind section, we see some similarities again, the bassoons and the contrabassoon playing the G sharp in octaves and some extra strength coming from the bass clarinet as well on that G sharp. In the clarinets and oboes, you see that same kind of coupling and you know the overlapping that we saw in the horns and the trumpets. You have the clarinets playing B, E, and B. And then this top B here is overlapped by the oboes, which continue to play E and then B again. So lots of roots, lots of fifths. English horn as well is reinforcing that root there, the E along with the clarinets. So as expected, we have a lot of strength on that root on that E. And the flutes and the piccolo cap off the top end in octaves, playing again B and E. In measure 25, he has some contrapuntal lines going on, but since they all follow the same rhythm, which is called homophonic writing, it almost feels like one overall texture, even though it's more like three ideas kind of working together. If we zoom into the woodwind section, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. The upper melodic line is moving downward, and then the bass line here is moving upward, so they're moving in contrary motion. And then the instruments kind of in the middle are really kind of just playing static chord tones. There is a little bit of movement between chord tones, so a little slight arpeggiation kind of feel. So you have this kind of static chord in the middle range. You have the upper line moving downward and the lower line moving upward. Let's break this whole idea down again by section. So we'll start with the strings here. As expected, the low string instruments, the cellos and the bass are playing the same line in octaves. So it's this upward moving line. Look at the upper strings, the violin one is playing that upper melody, that line that's moving downwards. And this is really interesting. The violins two in the very beginning are playing the upper line here along with the first violins in octaves, but they're also playing chord tones here and here, but then it kind of comes together and they just follow the line exactly here. So it's kind of weird. It has a little bit of a split function just for half a bar and then it joins strictly on the melody. And then the violas are playing that middle idea where they're mostly just kind of going back and forth between different chord tones. And then you have some double stops here, still chord tones. The timpanis are a little bit different this time, which I found pretty interesting. So it's got the same rhythm, but it doesn't quite follow the bass line exactly. It kind of starts and ends the same, but in the middle, there's a little bit of variation. 
There's a C here that's not part of that baseline. And then there's another D right in here that is also not the same note as the baseline. So even though the rhythm's the same like everything else, there are just a few key spots where he varies the note just a little bit. The bass tuba and the bass trombone follow the bass line along with the low string sections. Now the tenor tuba is a little odd right here. It provides some oblique motion to the line here and then at the very last measure here it joins in. So again, it's just an instrument providing some variation in the beginning and then joining the line later on. Same thing with the tenor trombones. You have one tenor trombone following the bass line and the other one providing some oblique motion, just holding on some chord tones until the last line where they kind of join in together. The trumpet's playing the top melody in octaves. Until this measure here, they all join in unison. So it gives that line a little bit more focus right at the end there. The horns here look a little bit more complex than they really are. So you have steady chord tones in here, in this area, and then when we get to this measure, we have a little bit of movement, but they're still playing chord tones. And also horns two and three, they started out playing separate chord tones, but then they join up in unison up here. You should start to notice a pattern here. Every time an instrument breaks from that melodic line and plays something else, what it's doing is taking from the larger harmony it plays. So it's just playing chord tones from the D minor seven chord. If we go into the woodwind section, contrabassoon, bassoons, and bass clarinet are all playing the bass line. The clarinets are playing the chord tones the entire time. They just have a little bit of movement, subtle variation throughout. English horn does the same thing, just playing around different chord tones. The oboes are also playing the harmony and just moving around slightly. And then surprise, surprise, the flute and the piccolo are playing the upper line in octaves for some nice kind of shimmering brightness up top. If you notice the woodwinds take up the entire treble clef with the harmony. Also, if you compare the top line of the different harmony sections, whether it's the woodwinds or the brass, the strings, whatever it is. Sometimes it's below the melody, sometimes it's the same note as the melody, but it's never above the melody. So it's never kind of crossing over the melody and competing for attention. In measure 28, he moves into this secondary idea and the orchestration shrinks to a much more intimate instrumentation. Even the chord is very small. It's just a G sus four chord within one octave played in string tremolos. And because the harmony has shrunk so much in the instrumentation, so does the melody here. We now have four horns in unison and they're playing this very short fragmented melodic idea that essentially is an outline of a G seven sus four chord. The rhythm here of this melodic fragment is similar to an idea we heard in previous measures. There's just some rhythmic diminutions and intervallic augmentations going on. So it's not a completely new idea, which is what makes this section so cohesive. It's also another case of harmony above melody, which is rapidly becoming one of my favorite techniques personally. And then in measures 33 through 36, we see a repeat of the gesture from measure 25, only this time it's four measures instead of three measures. So he's sort of playing with the time a little bit. And look at the orchestration. It's much smaller than the previous gesture. The violin one is now playing that melodic idea down an octave and the contrabass is playing up an octave. So he's strong not only the instrumentation, but also the register or the orchestral size, if you will. And notice the contrabass doesn't even play the whole time. It drops out right here as it's dovetailed with the cellos. So he's taking some of that weight off of the second half. And the bassoons start out playing the harmony, similar to what we heard in the previous gesture. And then they start to kind of shrink up a little bit. And then they all join in unison here and follow the bass line melodic idea. So again, that idea of kind of splitting function as we're moving throughout the measures as a way to kind of evolve the music. And the three clarinets, the top clarinet is playing the melody along with the violin. And the other two clarinets are playing the chord tones, similar to what the woodwinds did in the previous gesture. In measure 37, we have a repeat of the idea in measure 28. And the last measure of the phrase overlaps with the melody then beginning in the woodwinds. So during the four measure statement of the solo horn here, and then the three measure statement of the woodwind section playing that melodic fragment, the harmony stays in the string section the whole time. The chord now in the string section, he has kind of a mode change, which is really odd, but it's very interesting. So we have this bizarre sort of G7 sharp four chord without the third, but this time instead of the melody being G, C and F, it's G, B and F. So he has the B in the melody. So it's basically a G Lydian dominant sound overall. 
Repeating an idea and changing the mode and then sort of extending the fragments and shortening the fragments is a really great way to keep reusing material rather than constantly writing new material every couple of measures and having your music just kind of run away from you. Also in the Wubin statement, the notes are a little bit different. It's still the same arpeggio though that he's outlining. Measure 42, he has that overlap again between the woodwinds and the trumpet. And it begins to fragment the melodic idea even more with just one measure this time of the phrase. And that little one measure repeats three times. First in the solo trumpet, next in the clarinets, oboes, and flutes, and the third time in the bassoons. Now there's two things to notice as he's building tension by fragmenting this idea and repeating it in the different sections. Here he also adds some harmony notes underneath, so he has fourths and fifths. Same thing in the bassoons here. And then two trumpets do this kind of interesting thing where they start to play the end of the woodwind line here and then finish off in the very beginning of the bassoon. So he has this kind of meandering overlapping idea going on in the repetition. And it's another thing that kind of helps build that tension. Also in measure 43, the string harmony stops and then the upper strings play the melodic idea and then the lower strings play the melodic idea. In measure 45, the violins one and two start playing this fragmented idea. They have smaller intervals here, but it's still kind of the same G Lydian dominant feeling. And they're playing in unison with the horns one and two. In the harmony, we have the bassoons and the contrabassoon on the low end of the harmony along with the cellos and the bass. Violas are playing up an octave in the beginning here along with the cellos and then they move upwards and kind of expand the harmony outward. And horns five and six come in just for some key accents here and here. And then the trumpets as well come in at the very end just in this nice little accented chord here. In measure 49, the harmony is back in violins one and two. This time it's more of an E Phrygian sound. We have E, F, A, and D. So it's sort of a E7 sus flat nine chord. If you remember from the beginning, we started off in C major and the third mode of C major is E Phrygian. So he's changed modes, but he hasn't necessarily traveled a great distance. Just in case you didn't know, suspended harmony is kind of part of the same coin as quartal harmony and quintal harmony. So if you take this E7 sus flat 9 chord, this E, F, A, B, and D, and you stack them in fourths, you would get F, B, E, A, and D. Or you could also stack them in fifths, and you'd have D, A, E, B, and F. So you could take the same chord, right, the same kind of harmonic information, and stack it in different ways, and you'll get different feels, but you're not changing keys or modes. He starts to build back up the ostinato in the flutes and the piccolos, and you can see it's staggered similar to how it was the first time. The first melodic fragment is in the solo trumpet, and it's moving up in fourths this time. Measure 52 is pretty interesting because he's got these different ideas kind of overlapping and intersecting in this measure. He has the chords and the tremolo strings. He has the ostinato and the flutes and the piccolos. And he has this fragmented melodic idea here in the oboes, the English horns, clarinets, the French horns, the violas, and the cellos. In measure 53, we're back to the idea from measure 45, and the orchestration changes again. It's essentially the same idea, but the harmony has changed a little bit. Melody is in the violins one. It's in the first oboe, and the second and third oboes play the harmony. We have the English horn playing the harmony. Clarinets one is playing the melody, while clarinets two and three play the harmony. The bassoons come in towards the end for some extra strength and power. Horns one and two have that split function again, where they play the harmony in the first two measures, and then they join in the melody at the end. Horns three and four rest in the first measure, and then they join in in the harmony. And horns five and six join in at the end of the harmony. The first trumpet plays the melody in the very first measure of this section, and then drops out. The violins too have that split function again where they're playing harmony for the first two measures and then they play the melody for the second two. Now at the very end here they add double stops so they play melody and harmony. The violas play the harmony the whole time. The cellos do the same thing as the horns here and they join in a little bit later. And then the contrabass does the same thing as horns five and six by joining in towards the very end. So you can see as he's expanding the harmony he expands it in the horns and expands it in the string section at the same time. In measure 57, up until his final tutti chord, he's doing kind of the same idea in the strings, but this time it's more of a D sus flat 9 sound. For these four bars here, 
And then here he basically is playing kind of the same sound still, but he has a major seven instead of a flat seven. I'm not honestly sure what you would call that. It's a pretty weird sound. He may have just been going for some dissonance and he just liked that sound. Over top of the harmony and the strings, he's also building up that ostinato pattern back in the woodwinds. Again, the staggering between the flutes and the piccolo. In measure 61, the clarinets also join in the ostinato. Again, look how he staggers the entrance here. So it has a very smooth, growing kind of feeling instead of just kind of abruptly all coming in at once. And when he brings the clarinets into the ostinato pattern, he also brings in the violas to the harmony and the string section. He has the trumpets again playing this little melodic fragment in 57 and 58. And then measure 59, he kind of moves around this other fragment from earlier. Um, but he starts to kind of change the notes. He's moving upwards. Notice these very large jumps in the melody, so he's skipping around, he's creating a very jagged, abrupt kind of melodic idea, which is very good when you're trying to build tension. Also, when he's bringing in the clarinets here, and he's bringing in the violas here, and he's building up the harmony, he also adds two more trumpets here on this line, and then the other trumpet up top on this line. So he's also building the melodic line as well. That way it doesn't get washed out as you're also building up the harmony. And then all this tension and building leads up to this big final tutti chord here before it goes into the next section, which is a completely new idea. Let's break down this tutti chord and see how it's balanced. So this ending chord is a C sharp minor seven flat five chord. The balance is very strange in this. As we talked about earlier in the last chord, you typically have mostly roots, you have a few fifths, and then you have even less thirds. And if you have a seventh or another tone, you have even less of those normally. Uh, but in this chord, you can see we only have eight roots and then you have quite a lot of thirds, some fifths and a lot of the sevenths. If you look at how he kind of treats it though, it's the C sharp and the low bass in each section. And then the rest of the chord, the flat third, flat fifth, and flat seventh, which are E, G, and B, which makes an E minor triad. He kind of just treats that like an upper structure triad. So he's repeating that in different octaves in the woodwinds. He does it in the brass, and he also does it in the upper strings. If we look at each section separately, in the low woodwinds, we have the contra bassoon on the low C sharp, and then we have all three bassoons on the other C sharp. We have the English horn on the B here. This triad here is the three oboes, and then this one is the three clarinets with an overlapping here. The flutes play the B and the E as well, and then the piccolo play the same B and E just up an octave here. Typically, you'll see when you have one or two piccolos, if they're playing the same note as the flutes, you'll typically see them playing up an octave. They just work really well together. The piccolo is reinforcing those upper harmonics of the flutes. In the brass, you have the tuba playing the low C sharp. And the next tone is actually played by the bass trombone here, the other root. And then the other tuba is actually playing the E here. So you have the tubas and the trombones kind of interlocked. That creates a nicer, smoother blend between the different brass instruments. And then you have the tenor trombones, one and two, completing the upper part of that upper triad structure. And then the treble clef, you have just all four trumpets playing the, uh, the full upper triad with a doubling of the E. And the strings, same thing. The low C sharp is played with the double basses and the other C sharp is played with the cellos. Now keep in mind, even though I only put eight roots here, uh, these two roots being played are played by full string sections. So this is the entire double bass section. This is the entire cello section. So even though this number looks like it's pretty small, when you have two full string sections playing the root down here in octaves, that's a very strong, very powerful, very clear sound. And then the upper strings, you had the viola is dedicated to the B here, and then the violins one and two both play double stops. So the violin two plays the E and the B, and the violin one plays that G and then the upper E. And of course you had the nice percussion to kind of sharpen that sound, give it a little bit more of that punctuation. You have the cymbal crash and then the timpani. As always, I'm gonna end with a quote that I find inspirational. This one comes from Chopin's Piano. It's a really great book if you have the time to read it. And it's about the summer that George Sand uh, spent living with Chopin on the island of Majorca while he composed the preludes. She records his miraculous spontaneity on walks, humming away to himself, quickly returning home to try out a new idea. The piece then sounding to Sand, complete, sublime. But then came the most crushing labor I had ever witnessed. It was a train of efforts, waverings, frustrated stabs at recapturing certain details of the theme that he had heard. What he had conceived as a unity he now overanalyzed in his desire to get it down 
and his chagrin at not being able to rediscover it whole and clear plunged him into a sort of despair. He withdrew into his room for days, weeping, pacing up and down, breaking his pens, playing a measure a hundred times over, changing it each time, then writing it out and erasing it as many times and beginning all over again on the morrow with painstaking and desperate perseverance. He would spend six weeks on a page only to hark back to what he had first roughed out. So if you find yourself composing and banging your head against the wall, uh, don't beat yourself up too much. Even Chopin drove himself absolutely insane, as we all do when we're composing a piece and we're trying to just get it perfect. That's going to do it for us today. Keep studying, keep learning, keep growing. See you next time. Thank you.